So our first speaker is going to be Kieran Padoon, from, uh, who's the digital archivist at Arcadia University. Uh, and they're going to be followed by Carrie May and Zach Broad from the University of Pittsburgh. And uh, we'll end up with uh, Claire Webb uh, at, uh, sorry, Claire Newing, who's going to be talking about web archiving at the, the UK National Archives. Um, but as Jen hinted, uh, we have got about 20 minutes sort of presentation time for each speaker. And then uh, we'll follow that with about five minutes of Q&A and discussion if things are going to plan. Uh, and we'll cycle through the afternoon like that. And if we have a bit of time at the end, great. Uh, and I think if Sarah uh, gets to join us at the end, she's got a few sort of uh, closing announcements that she wants to tell you about. Oh, there she is. She's just joined us now. A happy waving face. So it's good to see you. Um, so uh, speaking of, of happy faces, I think I'll go straight over to Kieran. Uh, so Kieran is the digital archivist at Arcadia University in Canada, as I mentioned, and they're going to share their experience of developing a high level in just workflow for digital preservation at Arcadia. So Kieran, if you're ready to drive the Zoom, take it away. Yep, can see your opening slide just fine. Perfect. Awesome. All right. First of all, thank you, everyone. My name is Kieran Perdome, and I'm the digital archivist at Acadia. Um, I am so grateful for you all being here, and I'm I'm excited to be part of this community. I'm a new practitioner, a new digital archivist, so I'm just so excited to have um, the DPC and this community and, and all kinds of great resources as, as we at Acadia start on our digital preservation journey. So today I'm going to be talking about hot, really high level workflow development at Acadia. So it's going to look a little bit different from a lot of the other presentations I've seen in the series that are focused on workflows that are implemented and ready to go and working. At Acadia, we've just started our digital records program. Um, I started at Acadia in August and I'm the first digital archivist. So um, my presentation is gonna be a little bit more on the workflow development process and how I've been using that development process as a tool to map out all of the places that we need additional documentation, additional resources and support. Um, so I thank you all for um, the opportunity to share something that is a little bit more, um, is in a bit of a messier state, I guess, than, than um, other folks. And I think as I've been um, working to build something at Acadia, it's been great to see all the resources from other institutions. Um, but something that kind of I would love to see more of is are things that are a bit messier and in progress. Um, and so with that, I'm, I'm going to vulnerably share uh, what I am working on. So I will first give you a little bit of context about Acadia and then talk about um, why I'm designing this workflow and kind of the goals um, alongside of that. And then we can peek into the workflow itself and look at appraisal, transfer, processing, and storage. So where am I in the world? I am in Nova Scotia, Canada. You can see the yellow circle down in the right corner, um, way out in the Atlantic. And more specifically, I'm uh, at Acadia University, which is in Wolfville, Nova Scotia. And it's also important to acknowledge that it is on Mi'kma'k, uh, the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And something to know about Nova Scotia too, in terms of um, the context of, of universities here, there are a lot of universities in the province. There's about a million people in the province, but 10 universities most of which are located in Halifax, which is our biggest city, and Acadia, we are about an hour outside of that in more of a rural area. Acadia, like I mentioned, it's in Wolfville, um, in a region called the Annapolis Valley, which is a very uh, agricultural region, lots of wine production, fruit and vegetable growing, um, beautiful views of the Bay of Fundy, and that's the community and context in which we operate. And Acadia as a university is primarily undergraduate focused, which impacts in the archives what we do and the kinds of services we provide really focusing on teaching and learning. Um, and, and we are a small institution of about 4,000 students. 
Um, but that being said, we do have quite a bit of archival and special collections material. So we have three distinct collections. We have university records, private records about the history and culture of the Annapolis Valley. Um, the, the institutions in Nova Scotia have sort of divided up responsibility for geographic areas in terms of collecting practices. And so the Annapolis Valley is really where, where we focus. Also um, collecting private records that support teaching and learning at Acadia. And then um, Acadia was founded by Baptists in the early 19th century. And so we are also, we house the Atlantic Baptist archives. Um, we don't own those materials, but churches will deposit materials with us. And in addition, our unit is also responsible for special collections, which is about 27 collections, 50,000 titles, but that's not way more items than that because that doesn't include um, individual issues of serials. So we have a lot to work with. And in terms of our digital records program, I am primarily focusing on the um, digital, born digital university records, born digital records about the history and culture of the Annapolis Valley, those private records. Um, and then the third aspect would be um, digitized documents that we're producing so that we can hang on to those as well. Um, Oh, my cat is going to want to say hi. Um, so in our small unit, we have about four staff. Um, I'm the digital archivist. We also have an archivist, an archives coordinator, and the archives and special collections assistant who runs the reading room. And so like I said, this digital records program is brand new to Acadia, um, and I have the opportunity to really kind of build something from the ground up. So um, we have a lot of AV material in our collection, but it's inconsistently identified. Our digital storage for our digitized material is um, on hard drives that are past their end of life, so it's really urgent that we um, get a better storage system for our digital materials. And yeah, starting off, just no capacity to care for important digital records at all. So that's kind of just some context in terms of like, we're really at the beginning of this journey. Um, and there is a lot of opportunity and potential and different directions that we can take things. So when it comes to designing a workflow, um, the workflow has really been a way for me to start to guide our work at Acadia and working with digital records. Um, so I have created a tool agnostic, technology agnostic workflow that at a very high level can capture all of the components that are required for us to say, all right, we're doing a good job taking care of these records. You know, if this is in place, like things are working well. And considering our size and our capacity, it's very important that um, it's as simple as possible of really thinking, um, what are the what are the things that we need to do, um, but you know, also not making things too hard on ourselves. And I have also found this tool to be very useful for communication um, with other folks in the library being like, what is digital preservation? What is the work we're doing? What kind of equipment do you need of really being able to sit down and say, all right, well, these are the elements that I think we really need um, and we can go from there. Um, and so in designing this workflow at a high level, it's really become a checklist in terms of being able to set goals um, and identify areas where we need to develop more policy, we need to investigate tools, collect resources, those sorts of things. And so with that being said, I will dive into the workflow itself. Um, and so this is accompanying, um, the goal of this workflow is to look at basically taking records in and into the storage phase. So appraisal, transfer, processing, and storage are the functions that it covers. Again, at a very high level, not in detail. This, this is really um, a tool to map our process um, and be able to not, I don't know, be able to build a program here that is um, our process. It, we can find tools that will fit our processes rather than trying to say, okay, well, we have to use this tool, we're locked in here, and then trying to figure out what we need to do to make that work. Um, and so I have the opportunity to kind of start fresh and say, all right, well, what tools can, can support 
this work. Um, and obviously as things crystallize in different ways and we start to um, identify resources and things, um, there's going to be a lot of work kind of diving into this and fleshing out workflows. It's an iterative approach. Um, and so this is the high level overview. In the top left, you have a request to transfer records and down in the bottom right is where things go into storage and are monitored. Um, and so this is kind of the overview process of from beginning to storage. Um, and the first element, I'm gonna kind of identify each of those functions within this workflow. And the first section is focused on appraisal. So we get a request to transfer records and what are the things that need to happen so that you know we, we this, this process culminates in a document that is, all right, we have a transfer agreement, we have a deed of gift, this is something that we want to take in. Um, and so what needs to happen to get there is to have conversations about, oh, what, what are we looking for? Um, what, uh, what kinds of files can we support? Things like that. And then decide, all right, is this something we can take in or not? Um, and then be able to have conversations with the donor to really um, intellectually kind of get control of the accession in terms of understanding um, really what it is. And so with all of these stages, it's like, out. so out of this, it kind of emerges my, my, my to-do list of, all right, well, how do we um, make this happen? What are the, what are the, the policies and the tools we need to support this appraisal function? Well, you know, information about accepted file formats, what can we really support? And so I have created a file format guide um, that's going to be going up soon. And um, working with the other archivists and folks on the team to say, well, what kind of records do we want that are born digital? And like, how does this fit into our overall collecting policy? And working with donors and getting a survey together. So if someone has a digital donation, it's like, all right, well, here's going to be all of the, the stats. Um, what kind of media are they on? How much is there? How are we going to best get it? And so to be able to have that information kind of accompanying a donation. And then I also had to make adjustments to our um, transfer agreement and deed of gift because they were written um, not to kind of think about digital records or um, digitization. So we kind of added that in there as well. Um, the second function is the transfer stage of the process. So um, we know we want these things. All right, now, how are we going to get them? Um, and there are two ways that I could see us getting material. It's through cloud transfer or physical media. Um, and it's this cloud transfer part where I, I kind of have had to let go of, of some of um, my, I don't know, desires for, for implementing things like perfectly or best practices. Um, because, you know, there's concerns with transferring files through OneDrive, like you're going to lose metadata. Um, and how do you make sure that everything gets to where it's going? And so, um, but considering our small size and our user base and the folks that are going to be giving us material, um, we want, especially as we first start collecting things, for the bar to be sort of fairly low and for people to kind of understand how this process works and have for us the opportunity to test things out and, and make sure things are working. And so um, while that might not be the best practice for everyone, it's the best practice for us right now. Um, and along with this phase two is thinking about, all right, how do we make sure that these files are safe from viruses and uncontaminated and good to go? And this process culminates in, all right, this transfer is in our accessions database. We have this thing. There are no problems. It's good. Um, and so, yeah, so along with that, there's questions about, all right, well, how are we going to transfer? How can we provide support and instructions for our donors? Are there equipment that we need in order to be able to care for physical media? And how do we kind of uh, transfer files from there? And then um, working with IT at Acadia to say, all right, what, from a cybersecurity perspective, what are they requiring of us? How can we kind of negotiate and navigate something that's going to be workable? Um, and so that kind of, that issue is brought out in this section of the workflow as well. Um, the third stage is the processing stage. So um, how now, all right, we have, we have the items, they're in our accessions database and how are, um, 
we making them into a package that can be stored for the long term um, and we know they're safe, whether or not we are going to um, process them right away or they're, they're safe and they're good to go um, to be revisited later on. And so this too is where um, I wanted to not necessarily rely on, okay, well, we're going to use this tool because again, like it's, it's an open, it's an open field right now, right? Like we can kind of go any direction we want with this. So thinking about those functions that we need rather than like, all right, tools. Um, and so have things like creating file lists and file format identification, normalization, checksums, all of that. Um, and kind of thinking about what tools then will, will, will we be able to acquire to support those things. And along with that, um, metadata requirements of the elements that we need um, and how to make this as simple as possible. Um, and formatting specifications for, all right, we're packaging something, um, what needs to be in that package and um, those structures and things like that. So, and then finally thinking about storage. Um, so packaging for storage, all right, so um, we have that package and then it's gonna have to be transferred to longer term storage um, and monitoring fixity and file formats and all of that to make sure that we are actively preserving into the future. Um, and so the storage, like I mentioned before, is a big concern and issue for us right now. Like I said, these hard drives that are past the end of life is where things are currently living. Um, and so those have been conversations with IT and with library administration to say, um, that are very much in progress of like, what can you support um, and how can we make this more sustainable? And so investigating things like offsite storage with Amazon Web Services, seeing if Akedia is gonna be able to help host some things for us, um, really saying like, okay, this is an area that you know I need to do some legwork on and collaborate with other entities at the university to, to figure out how exactly this is going to look. But it's through designing the workflow that I'm able to see, all right, this is kind of something that needs to be on my to-do list. Um, and also in terms of monitoring and how that we're going to address that in an ongoing way. Um, so let's see. So thank you. Um, again, sharing something that's very much in progress, a draft we're just starting to build here. Um, but I hope, I don't know, it's helpful to some of you to see kind of what that process looks like starting from, from nothing here. Um, and it's been great to learn from folks that are much farther along um, on their digital preservation journeys as well. Um, but I have found, in addition to a number of other other things and resources and developing program statements and all of that is really sitting down and looking at this workflow um, from a high level has been helpful for me to, to really create those goals and to-do lists and say, all right, this is something that we need to focus on. This is on my list for now um, and be able to flesh those out. And as, as we iterate, as, as we're able to get equipment and, and things are, are, um, yeah, like come come a little bit more into focus, then I'll be able to iterate and go back and say, all right, well now, you know, this is the tool we're using or this is the, the capacity we have. How are we going to um, look at the workflow in, in a closer way and, and as these, as these um, files are coming through. Um, and so, yes, that is all I have. Thank you very much for listening and, and, and looking at something that's a little bit less polished and um, I'm very happy to share this and get feedback from you in the community and please feel free to reach out at any time. Um, but yes, I'm, I'm very happy to uh, be here. So thank you very much. Oh, thanks, Kieran. Thanks for talking us through that and describing the, the processes you've been going through. That was, that was fantastic. Um, so we have a few minutes for, for Q and A uh, and discussion. I uh, see people already weighing in with some some virtual applause. So uh, that's great. Please carry that on. Um, and you've um, already had a couple of questions come in. So uh, I'll just take them in the order in which they've come, which was um, the first one was from uh, Ellen, who asks if you could say a little bit more about the process of collaborating with IT on cybersecurity procedures. And if you've got any tips apart from buying them donuts or something like that. <laughs> um, I, I wish I had more tips to share, but yeah, like I mentioned, that's very much in progress. And 
Um, it's been challenging, I would say, because I think there's there's a, a a KDI, I think in general, is becoming more concerned about cybersecurity, which is great. Um, on the other hand, you know, I think that if someone's going to try to infiltrate the university with ransomware, an archival donation is probably not the place where that's going to happen. Um, so I think it's it's ongoing education and talking about um, like what our needs are and, and trying to get them to understand what what we're actually doing and how. Um, no, these aren't coming from just anyone. And there's a lot of other documentation that's going to accompany these things. Um, and also being able to share like what other universities are doing. And it's, you know, it's not this radical thing, um, like digital preservation, pro um, programs exist all over. Um, but I would say too, I'm very fortunate in that I have an ally in the library or library technology, um, specialist and, they have been awesome at helping me to navigate conversations with IT. They um, serve as a liaison. They know how IT works and, and their job is kind of helping translate what the library needs to the IT folks. So I would say that that has been a huge benefit. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions are starting to come in thick and fast now. I'm not sure we'll get through all of them, but I want to take this one that's just come in uh, from, from Heather, which asks about, um, are you mostly looking at uh, open source tools? And I guess I have a question, perhaps I missed it. Yeah, has Arcadia given you a nice fat budget <laughs> for all this work and uh, to think about spending or have they told you to do it as cheaply as possible? There's a budget request in for the next fiscal year um, and we will see how that actually lands. Um, but I, I do have a lot of support in um, I was able to just finally order um, like a processing workstation. So that's great progress. And there's support for what the library can fund in terms of storage. So um, that's very good. Okay. Okay. That was it. We'll keep our fingers crossed for you. Uh, <laughs> Catherine asks how the workflow that you've been describing intersects with making the digital content available to others. Are you just focusing on ingest at the moment or are you also thinking about discovery and access? Yes. Um, yes. Discovery and access is a whole other beast and I'll need to do a whole other workflow for that side of things. Um, yeah, this is really the focus on, all right, well, how do we, how do we get the stuff? Um, but I am thinking too, and especially with developing, um, those, those policies and working with tools of like, all right, eventually there's going to be the access side of this as well. Um, we are fortunate that we do have a um, digital content portal and platform. So um, we can put some content online. I think we're going to end up having to get a um, workstation for the archives reading room and a lot of um, like that's going to be a primary access point. Um, and we'll see in terms of when we start getting requests for this material of what you know, how labor intensive it, it is on my side of things to then then take these things out and prepare them for um, people to actually be able to access them, which is, you know, the whole the whole point. So, um, yeah, that's going to be a, a, a separate process. OK. All right. Well, thank you for that, Kieran. Uh, 